The general adaptation syndrome provides the basic physiological foundation for the entire training process because we know that when humans are exposed to a stress, we adapt to become better at dealing with that particular stress. So if we can apply an aerobic stress, we can become better at dealing with aerobic stresses. If we can provide a neuromuscular challenge by lifting heavy weights, then we can get a responsive neuromuscular adaptation. So when we take a look at the GAS image applied to training, it changes slightly. We just make it more specific to the training process. We still have our alarm phase here where we will have some decreased or diminished physiological function. This usually is a result of the fatigue accumulation during the training session. After we are done overloading the system, we are then going to enter into the recovery phase. But the recovery phase can be subdivided into two separate phases. We have the restoration phase, and this just really restores our function to baseline. It returns us up to baseline. But this also takes time, of course. Then we have the adaptation phase, and this is where we're actually building resiliency to our stress or we're seeing these training adaptations. Now, we have to understand that these adaptations are very cellular or microscopic in nature, but it's the accumulated effect of these. By repeating the appropriate training dose over time, you'll finally see some noticeable training adaptations. The strength of the stimulus or the overload experience as a result of the training session has to be sufficient enough or challenging enough to initiate adaptations, but it can't be too challenging because you could potentially overload the adaptive capacity of the system. If I draw your attention to the image on the bottom left, you can see that this is the response of a singular workout. So we have some diminished capacity here. We enter the restoration phase after the workout and ideally into some positive adaptations here. These adaptations, of course, they're cellular in nature. We don't really feel them or experience them, but repeated over time, they make a difference. But that workout could also be a little bit different. We could have done excessive training on that workout. And that, of course, training dose is a combination of frequency, intensity, volume, etc. But if we break the system down so far below baseline, we're really just going to extend the recovery or restoration time. And we can run into an issue here because what if this is three or four days later and it's time to train again? Well, the individual on the right hand side, though they felt they had a great workout because they pushed themselves really, 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 really hard. Well, now it's time to train again and they're not even recovered to baseline. Whereas this individual who has applied a more appropriate training dose combination, again, intensity, volume, etc., they've adequately recovered before their next training session. So if you can picture this graph repeated over time, we're going to break the system down again get some adaptation, break it down again, get some adaptation, so on and so forth. When we're discussing stress and the physiological response, we can discuss things in terms of a dose response relationship. And when it comes to training in general, the greater the dose, the greater the response. And the dose here is referring to the amount of overload being applied or the amount of training stress being applied to the system that we're training. If we take a look at the image on the bottom left, on the y-axis, we can see adaptation. So how much adaptation are we getting for, let's say, aerobic fitness or neuromuscular fitness or hypertrophy, what have you? But this is dependent, right? The y-axis is dependent on the x-axis, the training dose in this case, which is representing the training stress. So it's pretty clear to see that there is a linear relationship up to a certain dose of exercise. At some point in time, the dose of exercise will no longer stimulate a further degree of adaptation. And even up here, at higher doses of exercise, we're seeing a very much decreased return on our investment or return on our efforts. And at some point in time, we can actually apply, of course, as we saw on the previous slide, excessive training dose such that we're not even really able to optimally restore from it, let alone have positive adaptations. And this is why we often are suggested to use the minimum effective dose, or at least try to be in this adaptive zone or developmental zone and being mindful that, of course, everybody has a maximum tolerated or a maximum recoverable dose of exercise.